I'm going to be what? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Grace on this beautiful Sunday morning that God has given us on the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. I uh, hope all of you and yours are staying well during the times of this pandemic. In case you haven't noticed, I am not Pastor Chris. Uh, he is off on a well-earned vacation. Uh, he put in a lot of hard work in keeping our grace worship going through these trying times, <coughs> his Bible studies, meetings, and all the administrative work that went along with that. And we want to thank again Doug and Sam for putting us on live here again this morning. And I want to especially thank Pastor Chris, by the way, for providing the sermon and prayers before he left. So I take no credit for any of that. We continue our theme this morning of the stories Jesus tells, this time about forgiveness. So we'll begin our service with today's prelude. Becky, welcome again. Responsibly 
our entrance hymn. Oh, for a world where everyone respects each other's ways, where love is lived and all is done with justice and with praise. Oh, for a world where goods are shared and misery relieved, where truth is spoken, children spared, equality achieved. We welcome one world family and struggle with each choice that opens us to unity and gives our vision voice. The poor are rich, the weak are strong, the foolish ones are wise. Tell all who mourn, outcasts belong, who perishes will rise. Oh, for a world preparing for God's glorious reign of peace, where time and terrors will be no more, and all but love will cease. because he did not want to upset his father. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he assured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. We we'll read responsibly Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our inequities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. <coughs> Listen now for the gospel. Hallelujah. It is God's word that changes us. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit, melt and break our hearts of stone until we give our lives to God and God alone. Come, Holy Spirit, reveal in us God's holy word, that we may show the faithfulness of Christ our Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, find the broken, find the lost, confirm in us the fire and love of Pentecost. Listen now for the gospel. Alleluia. It is God's word that changes us. Hallelujah. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the first chapter. That would be the 18th chapter. 
Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times, because the kingdom of heaven is like a man, a king, who wished to organize all his matters concerning his slaves. But in making rulings on how to settle these matters, a slave who was indebted to him for 10,000 talents was brought to him. And since the slave could not repay the debt, his Lord ordered him and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold and the proceeds handed over. The slave fell down to worship him, saying, Have patience on my account, and I will hand back all. And the Lord, being caused to be compassionate toward that slave, released him and forgave him the debt. But then that slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And the slave, seizing his debtor by the throat, and said, Hand back what you owe. Then the fellow slave fell down, pleading with him, saying, Have patience on my account, and I will hand back to you what I owe. But the first slave did not wish this. But leaving, he threw the second slave into prison, until he would hand back the indebtedness. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You evil slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And was it not necessary for you to have mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And in becoming angry, his Lord handed him over to the Inquisitor until he would hand back all the debt. And thus, my Heavenly Father will also do to you, if you do not forgive each brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Glory to you, Christ. Please be seated. So, another one of the stories that Jesus tells to elaborate on this morning. Clearly, the theme for today is forgiveness. So I want you to take a moment and think about the last time you forgave someone. How did it feel? How did it feel deciding to forgive? How did it feel to offer that forgiveness? And how did it feel afterward? According to the books out there about forgiveness and how to forgive, it seems that deciding to forgive is not easy. And the actual forgiving is not easy. But if we push through these difficult parts, we will feel good afterwards. It seems that forgiving is kind of like dieting or exercise or having surgery. So is that your experience? Is that what happened the last time you forgave someone? Of course, every book lays out the reasons why it is hard for us to forgive. None of them are surprising. You can probably come up with a list of your own for yourself. Usually they revolve around the risk of losing something, losing respect, losing a sense of justice, losing the joy of revenge, that kind of thing. And the books also talk about why it feels so good once you are able to forgive. Again, you can come up with good reasons on your own, I am certain. But the author's reasons usually revolve around how you will feel liberated or freed in some way. They all say that being a forgiving person releases us and opens the future again to new possibilities for us. Is that your experience when you forgive? Now, while it's really interesting to read and think about all the advice and wisdom shared in the many self-help books you can find on how to forgive, what we are concerned about here this morning is what Jesus is saying about forgiveness. 
So like Pastor Chris has been having us do with the other stories we have heard Jesus tell this summer about the kingdom of God, let's take a closer look at this parable too. Now in his usual fashion, Jesus is telling this parable in response to a question he is being asked, this time by one of his own disciples, the Apostle Peter. And Peter wants to know how many times he needs to forgive another Christian, which is a good question and one we might want to know the answer to ourselves. And again, in his usual fashion, Jesus has a radical answer for Peter. Actually, two radical answers. The first is that famous line about, not seven times I tell you, but 77 times. Which, let's face it, is a lot. And it is the metaphorical way that Jesus is actually saying we should forgive as often as necessary, which may really be a lot. And that can be pretty challenging, or maybe even crazy, because forgiving as often as is necessary may mean that there is really no limit to how often we need to forgive, which is a radical perspective on forgiveness, but perhaps not surprising when it comes to Jesus. And then Jesus doesn't just stop there, he goes on to give Peter a second radical perspective on forgiveness, especially for how forgiveness is understood in our time. Did you notice how the story goes? It starts out sensibly enough. A master is settling accounts. A slave owns him a lot of money, a whole lot of money. And not surprisingly, the slave cannot repay. So the master does what justice requires and the law allows. The master demands that everything the slave owns be sold and the proceeds given to him to pay back the debt. It's the same thing that happens when we cannot pay a debt. The car gets repoed, the house goes into foreclosure, in the bankruptcy our assets are sold off to pay down the debts we owe. And this is how it works, because it makes the system of borrowing and lending work. Otherwise, lenders would not lend and borrowers would not be able to borrow. It was not long ago that here in America we saw how the whole economy starts to fall apart when that happens. So the master in Jesus' story is doing the right and expected thing. And in response, the slave does the right and expected thing when he asks for more time to pay the debt and promises that it will get paid. It is a reasonable request and proposal. The slave is not trying to get away with not paying what he owes, he just needs a little more time. He is not looking for total forgiveness, but a little grace to make good on his obligation. Again, this is how the system works. And if the master thinks that granting the slave a little more time will mean he gets his money, then he will probably give the slave an extension. That's how the system works. So, what does the master do? Well, Jesus sets the whole story off on a radical course because he throws in the magic word, compassion. The master has compassion. And from other stories in the gospel, we have already learned that those who have compassion do unexpected and radically gracious things. Remember the parable of the prodigal son, or as Pastor Chris calls it, the parable of the crazy father? Because as the father sees his wayward son coming home and has compassion for him, he restores him to his place in the household. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, who sees the man naked, beaten, and half dead on the side of the road, and has compassion for him, taking him to the inn and paying for his care. Remember how often Jesus has compassion for the crowds, who he teaches and heals. In every case, compassion leads people to do unexpected and radically gracious things. Like here, where instead of the master giving the slave more time to pay his enormous debt, the master responds to the slave's request by completely forgiving the debt. Now the slave owes nothing to the master, an unexpected and radically gracious act.
And it would be fine for the parable to end there and for us to celebrate that compassion of the master. But Jesus goes on because the really radical thing that Jesus wants to say is still coming. Because it turns out that the parable is not really about the compassionate master and his unexpected and radically gracious act of forgiveness. It turns out that this is a parable about the slave, about the one who was forgiven, which is an interesting twist from all those self-help books on how to forgive, which is an interesting twist. They're all about how hard it is for us to forgive and how great it will be for us once we forgive. In other words, they are all about the forgiver. In contrast, Jesus' parable is about the forgiven. It would be nice to find a self-help book about how to deal with being forgiven, one with a 20-day program to living a more forgiven life. So let me know if you come across one. The story that Jesus tells is really about what it means to be the one who was forgiven, about how to live a forgiven life. And the simplest way to understand is to say that when you are forgiven, you pay it forward. You then become the one who compassionately does the unexpected and radically gracious thing for someone else, because you can. The situation in the parable is a bit simplified, that's true. The slave who had his debt forgiven now owes nothing to the master. Absolutely nothing. So then it does seem really obnoxious at best and unjust at worst that this slave then holds his colleague accountable for a small debt. Clearly now the first slave doesn't need the money because his master has set him free from his debt, liberated him from any obligation to pay lifted his burden from his back. So for this slave to not pay that forward, for this slave not to liberate his colleague from debt as well, seems like pretty bad form. It also means that the first slave has not embraced what it means to be forgiven. Instead, he continues to live as if the master never acted compassionately toward him, as if he still owed on the debt as if he were never liberated by the Master's grace. See, Jesus is focusing on what it means to be forgiven. Unlike those self-help books that are all about how great forgiveness is for the one who is doing the forgiving, Jesus is saying that forgiveness is not so much about how great it is for the forgiver as it is for the forgiven. It is really for the forgiven that forgiveness is liberation new life. So now think again for a minute about the last time you were forgiven. How did it feel? What did you do in response to being forgiven? In Jesus' parable, the story ends just as we expect, because time and time again in the Gospels and throughout the whole Bible, we hear that God permits us to receive, or in most cases, suffer, the logical consequences of our perspectives. So this slave acts as if he was never forgiven, as if the master has not been compassionate, and therefore the slave suffers the logical consequences of his perspective. The master rescinds his grace, calls for repayment of the debt, and justice is served. And that was the reality the slave continued to live under, even after being forgiven. And Jesus tells us this story to remind us that the reality we live in is one of having received the unexpected and radical compassion of the Master as well. We have been set free of our debts, liberated from the cost of our sins, the burden of any hopelessness and despair has been lifted off our backs. We have been forgiven and can then live as forgiven, liberated to pay compassion forward, not just seven times, but 77 times. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please join me as we read responsibly the hymn of the day. <coughs> Called as partners in Christ's service, called well, to well, ministries well, of well, grace, well, we respond with deep commitment, <coughs> fresh well, lines well, of faith well, and trace. Well, May we learn the art of sharing, side well, by well, side, well, and friend well, with friend, equal partners in our caring to fulfill well, God's well, chosen well, end. Christ's example, Christ's inspiring, Christ's clear call to work and worth. Let us follow, never faltering, reconciling folk on earth. Men and women, richer, poorer, all God's people, young and old, blending human skills together, gracious gifts from God and folk. Thus new pattern for Christ's mission, in a small or global sense. Help us bear each other's burdens, breaking down each wall or fence. Words of comfort, words of vision, words of challenge said with care. Bring new power and strength for action. Make us colleagues, free and fair. So God grant us for tomorrow ways to order human life. Then surround each person's sorrow with a calm and conquer strife. Make us partners in our living, our compassion to increase. Messengers of faith thus giving, hope and confidence and peace.
Let us pray. In thanks for all the blessings of life, for work and rest, for food and shelter, for love and laughter, for beauty and harmony, we return these offerings to you, O God. We pray that our thanks is pleasing in your sight, that what we offer is used again for sustenance and growth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray as God's people. At the end of each position, petition, I will say, Gracious Lord, and I ask you to respond, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that out of your compassion you sent your Son, Jesus, who by the faithful works has given us forgiveness for all our debts to you. Send us that spirit that we will fully embrace the life of the forgiven, paying forward the compassion we have received in all that we do. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing of peace and hope to be with those who are anxious about their financial situation. Inspire our Congress to provide relief in this crisis so that no one goes hungry, no one becomes homeless, and no one sinks into despair over the loss of work and purpose and hope. Give compassion and patience, endurance and strength to the many who are serving those in need, and expose and bring down those who are illicitly profiting from others' pain. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that your blessing of confidence and hope fills your whole church, especially grace, as we re orient ourselves to new ways of being the church in these times. Stir our creativity and look with favor on all our efforts to remain faithful in our worship, learning, service, and community. As we continue to fast from gathering around your table, fill us with your grace in other ways. As we still cannot raise our voices in songs of praise, accept the words we speak and the works we do in your honor. Gracious Lord, Amen. Heavenly Father, as the academic year gets underway, we pray your blessing on all who are doing their best to have learning happen in a safe and productive environment. Give wisdom and insight to the planners and patience to the teachers, parents, and students who have to navigate the often clashing interests of health, school, and work. Gracious Lord, Amen. Heavenly Father, we also pray that you inspire the researchers working on therapies and vaccines, that they will find the cures they seek for us, and as they work, stir up our own sense of responsibility and discipline, that we will take the mitigating measures that we can to protect ourselves and our neighbors. Forgive us for our lack of compassion and for not fully applying the wisdom you have already given to us. Gracious Lord, yeah. Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessings on all the people who have suffered the devastating effects of Hurricane, Hurricane Laura. Strengthen those who are injured, gather those who are lost, and give courage to all to rebuild their lives once again. Give them the strength in body, courage in spirit, and patience in pain. Calm their fears and increase their trust in you. Gracious Lord, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are close to our hearts and are in need of your presence of wholeness and healing. Gracious Lord, and Father, we ask that you hear the prayers we offer for ourselves. And we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen. Amen. Now go in peace, serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.